a good son. <laughs> it's always a, a joy to be here uh, with the uh, Sarans as we get together from time to time to reflect upon and to pray uh, for the ministry so central to the life of the church, which is at the heart of Sarah. And uh, as was mentioned, I I began my ministry uh, as a priest um, when the bishop, uh, actually the rector of the seminary, when I was just before I was ordained, told me they're going to send me away to study and to teach in the seminary. So I, I spent well, almost 20 years uh, in St. Peter's Seminary in London, Ontario, teaching scripture, teaching English literature too, because I, when I was a seminary, I also did some English. Uh, and then I went off and they, they made me a bishop. And they, I sent off for 10, 10 years in Alberta, uh, the wonderful diocese of St. Paul, a people kind of place, as they say, a little sign outside the town, and then Archbishop of Edmonton, and then for the last little while, 16 years, I was Archbishop of Toronto. And uh, very, very much my whole life in ministry, the seminary has been central, and I, the three main English language seminaries in Canada, St. Peter's in London, where I spent about 20 years, St. Joseph's, in Edmonton, which I, I was very much involved in, very much involved, at St. Augustine's in Toronto. And so and now that I have um, come to the uh, end of the, I would say the worry part, the burden part, the responsibility of administering a two million person diocese, it's a little bit, you know, I'm not in distress anymore. I don't do that. Um, I left the young lad uh, who took action call. So he was, uh, he's 53 and I'm 77, so, you know, he was, I think, two years old when I was ordained the priest, so. That, that puts, uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful bishop, which is one of the great joys of being, uh, there's nothing better when you're retired at all than you have this wonderful bishop, of, uh, our bishop, uh, Francis Leo, is, is now the spiritual shepherd, he's my bishop in Toronto, and he's doing just so wonderful, wonderful work. And so I have returned to the seminary. Uh, I'm now living in Sarah House, uh, and Sarah House is, is an old uh, building from 1904, and since about 1980 it's been used as a, uh, a sort of extension of St. Augustine Seminary. It's in the center of uh, near the University, and uh, St. Augustine's is out by the lake in the eastern part of uh, Toronto Scarborough. And so uh, it was kind of falling down, and so I decided one of the, one of the last things they did are from Built, trying to build up the program at the St. Augustine Seminary, the length of the program. Vocation discernment is a crock pot, not a walk. Hey, the time. Like that. And developing a thing where, you know, you don't uh, wait people just wander in and get an application. You work with them for a year or two and then decide whether you give them an application to apply. <laughs> you know, that's the way to do it. Um, and so I've spent uh, 16 years very involved with St. Augustine Seminary. And, uh, and then, and also deciding to expand, and uh, the uh, Sarah House, now that we built a new section behind it, and now it's uh, it has capacity for about 26 seminaries, about 15 now, because in that neighborhood we're in, you don't ask for permission to build twice, you do it once and prepare for expansion. Um, but it's the downtown portion, it's a section of St. Augustine Seminary. It's all one seminary, but this is the downtown campus, you might say. And it just happens that in the front of it, on the second floor, there's a little apartment for the little old me. And uh, I have absolutely no authority, I have no jurisdiction whatsoever. I can hear anyone's confession. It's amazing. You can't when you're, when you're a bishop, you know, you can't hear people's priest confession because you might have to decide about them and all that. So, but now I'm just, uh, so I'm there with my little, little wonderful, wonderful community, 15 seminarians. Oh, it's such a joy. And I just uh, wander around the countryside doing various things. And, um, and rejoicing in uh, the, the wonderful work that Archbishop Leo is doing. Uh, and then I, but I have to stay away. I, I don't go to masses where he is. He, he, you don't want to have the old guy leaning over, you know, breathing down your, your neck. Uh, I, and so I'm just bounding around the countryside doing retreats and things like that. And I have uh, two, uh, well, a couple things, groups of which I'm very much involved. Well, obviously, with Sarah, Sarah Canada and Sarah International and also the Canadian Bible Society. 
uh, when they knew I was free, they kind of I, I invited me to be on the board. I think I'm the only Catholic on the board. Um, I, I always joke that they're all for sola scriptura, I'm for nulla scriptura. But no, that's, no, 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 no. Uh, I just add a little dimension uh, to it. But anyway, enough, enough, enough. I'm about the babbling on. My favorite song about the water of Babylon, because I tend to Babylon, Babylon. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just um, meditate a little bit uh, on Christian joy and the importance of it in our ministry and our life as Christians, as disciples of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and also its importance in the reality of vocations to the Holy Priesthood and in religious life. My teenage heart was deeply touched when I was a high school student by Father John Henry Newstead, who was my teacher. He taught English. Uh, it was remarkable to see him very dramatic. He was a kind of an effervescent personality. Um, I think it was sort of like, uh, I don't know, like kind of Carl Dole or something, kind of very bubbly and, you know, I'm, I'm not, my bubble factor is not as high as that, you know, but, but he was a very uh, joyful, bubbly kind of personality. You know, just watching him read out a poem was something else. I never I never oh my gosh, he was something to hold. And that kind of got me interested in this literature. And I knew he was a, he was a man with experienced great suffering. As a young man, he'd been in the hospital a lot. Something to do with his lungs. I don't know, I think it was emphysema or some, something. I, I never quite realized what it was, but it was something very serious. And he began to appreciate um, the presence of people who cared for him. And so when I was a teenager, I, I was very aware, all of us were, but I particularly, that our teacher at the high school and our associate in the parish, uh, young father Newstead, Every afternoon, every single afternoon, he went to visit the sick. And uh, that fidelity, 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 every single day, not some dramatic, oh, I don't visit the sick, but just quietly there, not counseling, not doing that, just being there. Being there. That's what matters every day. In fact, until shortly before his death, and he couldn't do it anymore. Uh, that really impressed me. But the other thing that impressed me, the thing I want to emphasize uh, today, is the joyful spirit. Oh, he did have a bit more of a bubbly personality than, than a lot of people, but it was that wasn't what it was so attractive, because that can be kind of uh, manic or something. It's, it's a personality thing. Some people are kind of more uh, lively, others are more quiet. You know, it's just a, it, no more significant than the color of the hair or something like that. It's, it's just different people. But what there was deep within him was this joyful spirit. I wanted to be like him. Because I was so touched by the way in which he cared for others, the way in which he he visited the sick, the way in which he himself had been purified through suffering, and and the serenity. I think they call the joy. It's not like a personality. It's the deep serenity that was there at the heart of him. And I touched my heart as a teenager. And so when I was in grade eleven, and he called me aside and said, "You know, Tom, you should think about becoming a priest." It was that, it was the fact, not just that he said it, but that he said it. I don't even think he knew what I was thinking about it, but, but that was it. So he was kind of my confessor from the time I was a teenager until the time I was Archbishop of Edmonton. And when I was called to be a bishop, you get to have uh, two priests on either side of you. So it was such a joy to have Father Newstead beside me at that time. It's just that deep joy, deep, deep joy. When I became a priest on May 5th, 1973, you know, you get to pick a model, most priests do. And so I picked a thing from Psalm 100, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him singing for joy. And I was very touched my last, last year when my final year as Bishop of, Archbishop of Toronto, my, my seminarian said, the ones who are now entrusted to Archbishop Leo, the, the, the class that was ordained last year, picked as their class one, serve the Lord with gladness. Can be important to sing. Because I think it is that which is so important. It's important in our life in Christ. And uh, it is very important. Happy, healthy, holy priests. Joyful, healthy, holy priests. Happy, my is more of the courage of the past. You know, but, 
happy, healthy, holy priests attract, as indeed happy, healthy, holy lay people, disciples attract people. See how these Christians love one another. Just drew people to Christ. We are, you know, say you may be the only Bible your neighbor reads. Think about it. Uh, and so that joy is uh, something that is, it's at the heart. If we really believe what we believe, if we know our Lord Jesus and his life in the, in amongst us, coming to us, it will fill us with joy. Uh, Jesus Christ in word and sacrament. This is where we encounter him now. And think of what, what happened to us. Oh, you know, Peter jumping out of the boat and running to him. The same with the, uh, um, Don Bosco. Once somebody went, ran toward him, ran through a play concert to, to get to him. The same with the, the St. Philip Mary. You know, the, the joy we had, uh, it's constantly filled with joy. And was, this isn't frivolous joy. You know, happy, happy, all is well. And, you know, get happy face done. No, our standard in front that we carry before us. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. The joy here is not a frivolous joy. It is the deep joy that comes from knowing that he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself even to death and death on the cross. To be so much love for us. This is the joy we're talking about. It's not a frivolous joy, not a manic joy. That, in fact, is a false uh, thing. It's, it's, it's odd. You know? And that's not what God calls us to. But I remember, I remember once when I was studying over in Rome, my bishop sent me to, to go there, and I remember there was a little hill up near the geniculum, somewhere I can't, I don't know if I could find it again. Now, there's an oak tree or something where Philip Mary used to gather uh, young people together and have paintings there. And it says, now it says in Italian, there's a poem, something like Torquato Tasso, the Greek poet, would, would, here he would come to mourn over the sins of the city of Rome. But Philip Mary, Foolishly wise and wisely foolish, but have picnics here with the young people. You ever think that's it? It is that, that, that profound joy, which I know I saw in Father Newstead, and I think it touched the hearts of a lot of people. It is a deep joy based upon the commitment to divine providence, an awareness of seeing the hand of God. It's not a joy that comes from personality, you know, because some people are more bubbly, some people are more quiet, more reserved. Uh, that's a surface. It's a deep, deep joy that comes deep from a profound act of faith in the provident hand of God. That's what it is. And in fact, I will always run for the exit of a kind of religious, if you have a pumped up joy, as it has a substitute for religion, you can produce that. Uh, not real joy, it's a kind of manic, uh, I don't know what you call it, you know? I don't know how you spell it, but, uh, hello, or when you see people with a smile locked on their face, you know, hello, be happy, serve the Lord, you know, they, oh my gosh, this is nuts, you know, what, oh, you know, this is not normal, you know, people, you know, but it's the kind of joy that, as in, I think, Father says, life was mixed with an awareness of suffering. I think I heard somewhere it said that Mother Teresa, when she would, scan the novices for her order, she would insist that they have a joyful spirit, not because they're happy, happy, you know, everything is fine, you know, people are dying in the streets, you know, this isn't happy, happy. But rather, because she said, our work is so difficult, so grievously difficult and painful, that we must be filled with the spirit of joy. The joy that comes from fidelity to Christ. And I think of our heavenly patron, you know, sort of that energizer bunny of sense, you know, that kind of moving onward, ever onward, you know, things that crash by, you keep on moving, always onward, never backward, you know, amazing, amazing. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether he, whether he would tell jokes all the time, I sort of probably suspect that he wasn't, but that kind of strength, a purpose, zeal, comes from the joyful spirit of the Lord within and he named himself, or he was named, I don't know how they picked his religious name, after Brother Juniper. And Brother Juniper was called the Jester of God. The Joker of God, the Jester of God. He was picked personally by, by St. Francis. You know, and, and St. Francis himself was not, um, you know, he would talk about the stigmata, you know, he's not like a like a, a, you know, frothy kind of guy. The stigmata, he was, you know, embracing the leper and things like that. This is not 
frothy joy. But at the deep, as we see, there he is. You know, the, the whole, the glory of his life with the penance and the austerity, but at the heart of it all, the joyful service of the Lord. And he personally welcomed Brother Juniper. He said, if I had a forest of junipers like this, we'd be able to you know, change the world. And Brother Juniper said, and so our, our patron is Juniper Sarah, Sarah, named after this joyful saint. And I, I think that's, that's what it is. It's a fidelity and a profound trust in the provident hand of God and a deep closeness to our Lord Jesus Christ. This attracts people. People see it, they notice it. You can't fake it. And that's why I always get turned off a bit when you, you see a lot of these. I'm going to be careful what I say here. No, no. <laughs> oh, I'm retired. Be careful. <laughs> but, you know, when, when the church started, they think you have to fake joy. You know, happy, happy, like youth things and all that, where they're just, uh, you have a. Uh, you know, elderly ecclesiastics dancing to songs they think the teenagers are singing. <laughs> oh my gosh, I mean, it's, it's well intended, but it's as phony as I mean, it just doesn't make sense. The joy comes from within the heart, and the heart is the heart on fire with the love of Christ. That's true of Philip Neri, it's true of Emperor Juniper Sarah, and it's true of all the great saints. Philip, you know, it is so true. We have to avoid, the, uh, I think, be wary of an artificial, uh, manic cheerfulness, because that doesn't last long. It won't. Uh, it won't endure a, a bout of suffering. It's not a happy face we carry on the on for processions into the cross of Jesus Christ. And here is the source of our salvation. Here is the source of our joy. In the love of Christ Jesus for us in all of our crosses as we carry them. And so it is. And that's why I, I often think, I, a few years ago, for different reasons, I wrote a pastoral letter on the Sacred Heart. Uh, because partly was one reason was to kind of realize that for Catholics, that's the symbol of the month of June, everyone, you know. It's not a, a secular pagan symbol that really is, is brittle and thin. And lacking in depth, and therefore, an ultimate joy. But it is the Sacred Heart of Jesus that gives us our joy and our love. And this year we have the 350th anniversary of the Revelations to Saint Margaret Mary. But that's not the heart. That's not the foundation of the Sacred Heart devotion. It comes way, way back to the Gospel to Saint John. It goes way, way back to the Fathers of the Church, the Saint Bonaventure also, the Saint Gertrude, and others of the Middle Ages. And it takes a certain turn to the wonderful visions of St. Margaret Mary, and also always connected to the Eucharist. The loving heart of Jesus. What does the heart mean? Steadiness. That's the love that brings us joy. Not a kind of a, ooh, you know, that's frothy, that's brittle, that's temporary, that doesn't last. It's, it's a substitute for the joy that's at the heart of faith. It is from the heart. It must be there. And that's what is attractive to people to follow Jesus Christ our Lord when they see his disciples so filled with that deep, deep joy. And when a person sees a priest or a religious who is filled with that joy, uh, it really touches the heart. And that's what draws. Is that as a very wise old priest said, yeah, I never saw, I only met him at his funeral, actually. He was uh, horizontal at the time. Uh, he was the former spiritual director of the seminary. I just arrived at the seminary, and about, about the three days we had to go to the cathedral for a big funeral. So I went down, and this, this Monsignor Forrest still was there. I, he, was, he was horizontal. You know, priests are horizontal twice in their life. Face down with the ordination, face up at their funeral, you know? Um, and, uh, and in between, what matters is what goes on in between. That's what matters. But I'm just amazed. All these priests, all these lay people, all these bishops are all there for this person I barely heard of. But one of the many saying, one of the sayings was the faith that is sad or bad and not glad is bad. So that's, I'll just throw that in. It is the joy, the 
think that it's sad or bad and not glad is bad. And it's very true. Look at Catholic Twitter or whatever actually people are. Look at Catholic media, you know, you can see people, you look up, oh, Jesus, oh, you know, oh, 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 oh. you know, this kind of thing. This is not the approach that we should follow, you know. Oh, I am committed to my mind. Oh, my God. Anger is a terrible thing. You know, whether we should be angry at injustice, certainly. If we're not angry at injustice, is a problem. Or angry at some of the things in society and some of the things in the church, for that matter. Oh my gosh, you can't make it up. Uh, you know, oh my Lord. Believe me, the higher in the hierarchy I've been floating along, the more you say, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> but anyway, but it's all in the hands of God, you know. It's, we, but we have to do our bit. And we don't sort of figure, you know, God, we just serve faithfully. That's what we got to do. And do it until we die. And that's it. Away we go. There we are. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, sort of committed to uh, the seminary very much. I have a seminary at the cemetery. You can from the seminary. John was a cemetery. It's full of mausoleum. Wonderful. This the bishops of the diocese. Several of them. Some great ones there. And there's one spot empty. So I put my little sticky on. That's where I go. So I can end up at the cemetery near the seminary. My long term condo is very small. So there we go. And so we look to. The Sacred Heart of Jesus, this is the great encyclical by Ias the Twelve, the Horietus Aquas, which comes from, which means you shall draw water. It is from 12, chapter 12, verse 3 of Isaiah. You shall draw water joyfully from the wells of salvation. And that's uh, what Isaiah speaks, not in a happy, happy time, you know, all as well, but in a time of disaster for the people. God speaks through Isaiah, says, you shall draw water joyfully from the wells of salvation, as you're going through the desert. It's the wells of salvation that bring you joy. You draw water joyfully in when you need them, where they're not abundant water for you. It's like an oasis in a desert journey. Like if you look uh, uh, down in, in, in the Holy Land along the Dead Sea, you know, you have dry, deadly desert, sand, you know. You're coming up, and it's the water you can't drink it, it's all salty. And then you come up, you think you can get it. You have greenery, palm trees, water pouring out, cool water, shade, you know, all kinds of stuff. Oh, it's so beautiful. And then you go a bit further, deadly desert, you might die. So, what we have to do, if we're to find the joy which is of God, we need to find the oases in the desert journey, know where the life giving water is. And not get sucked in by mirages where you just run for the palm tree and then you can do the fountain, it's just sad. A lot of them are around, you know. The killer is illusion. But we can't identify and distinguish between the real source of our joy and that which glitters and you know appears to be. There's too much of that around. And uh, there we are. So you will draw water joyfully from the wells of salvation in the midst of your desert journey. So what we need to do as Christians, looking around at the desert journey, oh my gosh, you know, politics, you know, oh my God. You see what's going on, and in the church some things, you know, and in society, and in, oh my gosh. Uh, you can, one could get a little discouraged, but a lot of we have faith, though, and I think some of the the horrors that we are navigating through a swamp, you know, uh, and the horrors that we might have to get a less wet image, the desert, we're running across the desert. But in the midst of it, our hearts must be filled with joy, not because we can't see what's in front of us, because we can, we must see that. It's a mirage that we see, I'm happy because all is well in every way, things are going to be good, you know. No, that's not true. What's not true never brings us joy. Illusion is the killer, it's the killer. It's, a, it's like, you know, like alcohol and drugs have no source of joy. They're temporary, they seem fine, but boy, at the end, you don't, there's no joy. And so we must do that. Seek to find the sources of evangelical joy, of the good news, and then by our lives speak. And certainly this is true for priests and religious that, uh, this is, this is true. This requires of all of us purification because what 
robs us of the ultimate joy, which is the peace in the depths of our hearts, is sin. Sin is constricting. Sin is the triumph of the isolating ego, uh, as the great Sir Humphrey Appleby and the funny, funny thing, uh, um, you know, but yes, is the, the perpendicular pronoun. I. That's no happiness. That there's no songs in Dante's Inferno. No songs, no music. You only get music when you get in the bound of purgatory, any on to paradise. That's what I always say, you know, the only song in hell is I did it my way. You know, there's no hope in that. And so where do we find the sources of our joy, which will help us as Christians to evangelize, and which will help all of us in the mission of Sarah to evangelize in the dimension of the vocation to the priesthood or religious life and helping people see that. Well, there are many sources of it. But I, I'll just mention three sources. I once had a wonderful teacher. He, he was such a, he ever gave three points. He always said, if you ever became a bishop, this might ever have three points. But um, anyway, here, here are a few things. First of all, to spend time with the one we love. It's true. Family love too, you know. Uh, but to spend time with the one we love. And that means to spend time in adoration and prayer, a still point in this turning world. We don't want to live on the edges, in the shrubbery of the edges. We want to go deep to the center, to the center where is Jesus. We want to go within the interior castle to the center, not the swamp, not the boat full of snakes and toads and things. To move inward, to go to that deeper simplicity, which is at the heart of it all. To learn from the wisdom of the Carthusians. The one religious order has never been reformed because it never needed it. And they've been persecuted though, they've been massacred, they've been horrible. But, and their motto is, that croaks to both of their hearts. The cross stands firm while the world spins. So we've got to go to that center point every day in different ways. Sabbath time, palace and time is what the Jewish rabbi calls it. And that is where we will find the joy and the strength to minister, to reach out, to proclaim, to share. We can't give what we have to God. And so we need to be there in peace. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening, as, as the Archbishop said yesterday. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Not listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. You know, that's, that's not the right way. We have to be at peace in the heart of the Lord. And that's where we bring our cares and our troubles. And that we need to do. We need to be there and be with the Lord, not just talk about the Lord. And from that, we uh, everything else flows out. Now, what do we do there? Well, just be with the Lord. But, but I think certainly it's a time to become immersed in the Word of God. Read one chapter of the Gospel a day. The Bible, my Bible, is read because the Bible wants to be read. You can't get away with the pun. I mean, Father Newsom also taught me a love of puns. But uh, you know, just to get permeated by the Word of God, get pickled in the Word of God, get marinated in the Word of God. Just let it swim through the sea of the Word of God. Let it become our, our natural environment, especially the Gospel. Because there's a phony Jesus, a not really our Lord, made of meringue. You know, air and sugar and nothing but a little bit of egg. <laughs> Just, and, and that's the one that substituted. They substituted that for our Lord Jesus Christ. No one's going to die and live for uh, meringue, sugary, empty, airy, frothy Jesus, which is what is substituted sometimes but in Christian education, even in the Christian thing, and even that uh, high levels in the church. You know, people sort of say, if you want to make everyone love Jesus, just happy, 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 you know. Uh, what, what do you want us to say? What can, I, can you tell me? If you don't like my principles, I'll change them. You know, I've got better ones. Can you think of the new ones? We proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ. 
not cross of Jesus Christ, and here is the source of our joy, we come before the Lord in prayer and adoration. I remember once somebody said to me, I'll fuzz it up, nobody will never know, some priest said to me, I'll fuzz it up even more. Um, I was giving a talk to the Sacred Heart, and he said to me, you know, of course, the Eucharist is a verb, not a noun. I said, what on earth does he mean? Because actually it's a noun. Uh, <laughs> there is a verb, I give thanks, you know, Eucharist. But I think what he meant was, don't be wasting your time and adoration. Get out there and serve the poor. It's a verb, action, action, action. Not just being with the Lord, but action, action, action. No. No. Our action flows from our being with the Lord. And our being with the Lord bears fruit in action. The act of faith, my Lord and my God, leads out. Think of my grandmother Teresa, an hour of adoration, the holy sacrifice of Anthem on the streets with the poor. It's not that there's a contrast. Are you for action or are you for adoration? Which do you choose? Remember, that's a Protestant way of looking at things. I know, faith or reason, which is it? You know, faith or action? No, it's together. And we have to constantly come. We come, remember that our whole life is lived between two very short words. And they begin and end the gospel. The first says, come, come follow me, come be with me, be with the one, come and see. And the last is go. You can't come if you don't go, that's no good. But if you go and you don't come first, it's no good either. So adoration and action come together. And so that's Sabbath time. It's very important to fill us with fruitful, apostolic, evangelical joy. Not frothy joy, not manic. <laughs> Have to, you know, no, not that. And not even psychological joy. Some people are kind of cheery and others are not. But rather the deep thing. Secondly, death. That's my second Sabbath, death, memento mori. Think of the wisdom that comes from the shortness. Lord, teach me the shortness of life that I may gain wisdom of heart. This is a great source of our joy. You might joy? Yes, joy. This life is short. Eternity is long. Think about it. There we are. My one of my great heroes. I've got two great, great heroes. The time of Henry VIII. You know that egotistical Henry the V. I, I, I. I always thought it so appropriate. It's, it's, not, it's a flute, you know. But I mean, I, I, I. Um, and uh, you ever see the uh, movie Man for All Seasons? It's somewhat. It's accurate. Uh, everything except the fundamental point. It's accurate on the story. It just gives a very false view of what. Thomas More thought about conscience. He didn't say, I will do it because of my conscience. He said, I, I follow my conscience with his conscience, with knowledge. It's because I've checked the fathers of the church and the gospels and it said the king is not the pope. You know? <laughs> there we are. But you have two saints, Thomas More and John Fisher, two great saints who were both beheaded out of fidelity to the pope, to the office of Peter. Now, in their whole life, they never do a good pope. Uh, they had all kinds of, Alexander the Sixth, oh my gosh, and Julius the Second Warrior, Pope Leo the Tenth, you know, said, this God has given us the vacancy, let us enjoy it. Oh, this is not good. You know, they didn't, they were in a bad patch of popes at the time. But they could see the office, and they were joyful. You know, famously, Thomas More, who was kind of a cheery personality, he had a deep joy, and he was cracking jokes on his way up, you know, oh, you know, help me on the way up to the scaffold, oh, how, take care of myself on the way down. And he pulled his beard out of the way and he said, this didn't commit treason, and be careful how you aim, uh, you know, the, the executioner. I don't want you to get a bad reputation, you know, in your, your trade. And so, so, but John Fisher, maybe because he's a bishop, actually was named a cardinal just before he died, which might have contributed to <laughs> executing him. Um, there's one thing I just, I know I've mentioned this before, but I always think of it. When they woke him up at five in the morning on the day he was to be beheaded, they said, Bishop Fisher, the king has ordered that you be beheaded today. They said, oh, yeah, when, when, what time is it? Five, when am I gonna be beheaded? 10 o'clock, oh, okay, wake me up before. And he rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> now there's a guy with a joyful heart. Now, he was much more serious than Thomas Thomas. He did what the jokey guy like Thomas Moore. He wasn't kind of warm, he was kind of austere, you know. 
but he, he had a joyful heart. That's the way. So, an awareness, teach me the shortness of life that I may gain wisdom of heart. That's what we need. To realize life is short, eternity is long. Tick, tick, tick. Time's up. All of us. We're just passing through, like a little bird going whoosh, and out the other on the door, like an old monk from the Anglo Saxon time to talk to the king, did you know life is just the bird with flying through one window and not the other? That's life. So don't hitch your wagon to a falling star. You find the joy in that. This is just a brief, this is the runway, it's not the journey. The runway is sometimes smooth, sometimes bumpy, sometimes relatively long or short. Who cares? It's lift on. And it comes to any of us at any time. You can come to the old, maybe think of it more. I think now I'm 77, think not too much more than when I was 17, but it comes at any time. We have some saints like Therese of the Zoo who died in their 20s, and some like Therese of Calcutta who died in her 80s. Or this is a real fundamental. It is a sense, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. That's what matters, and that's what gives us the serenity and joy. That's why it gives us the strength, too. Like, life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we've got wicked, wicked horses all around us, have you noticed? <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh, look at the Paris Olympics. You've got to be kidding. Oh my gosh, I mean, this tells us what we're up against. So this is why we shouldn't have a ha 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 joy, no, but a deep joy, persistent joy, a joy not optimism, for which there's no reason at all, but hope. You know, that's the spirit, hope. The comfort awareness of the shortness of life and the power of the Lord. Also, uh, I'll just end up because I'm battling on too long. Um, I'll turn my ring like uh, Frodo and disappear. <laughs> uh, um, but also, uh, I say that because I spent a lot of time studying the apocalypse. The apocalyptic vision of things. I mean, see it from a point of view of God. We do that by immersion before the Lord's sacrament and reading the Word of God. It's that's the perspective, not the perspective of this world, the passing things come and go. See it, the vision, the context of our life is the provident hand of God, which is what the apocalypse is all about. And that's what gives us our joy, our awareness uh, of the providence of God. And that gives us strength, strength, not arrogance, but strength to be a witness to Christ, to be, to, to be willing to die for Christ, as so many of our brothers and sisters are doing but also be willing to live for Christ. It's because we know who he is. That's what gives us the strength. So, that joy, deep joy, not manic, cheerfulness, this is not real. Deep joy is what we're called to. It's a, it's a fruit of our life and our faith. And it's what attracts people to Christ. It's also what attracts people to the priesthood, which is life, you know. That deep joy, whether person personality is bubbly, or is serious, it doesn't really matter. Deep, deep joy, bubbly. Thomas More, serious John Fisher, equally joyful in that. And that's what also is, is what our mission is service. It is to live that life of joyful service. Amateurs, Christians, basically. My favorite hymn, I'll end off with a, a line from my favorite hymn, Will God Be on All Praising? Uh, <laughs> it's a funny one. I always did leave a funeral to end off with Jerusalem, some of Jerusalem. And so, but when the funeral of my sister nine years ago, uh, sister, my sister Patricia, um, we went into the funeral with the, my favorite animal, God Beyond All Crazy, coffin rolling down the aisle. I thought, well, how very nice they think. And I heard it probably later. Well, actually, my sister Patricia, who was in the coffin, and she picked that sip. Tommy always goes down the aisle with that. I want to go down with that <laughs> at some point. So, so she did. But okay, that's not secret. She's also, she was also, she's the middle child. My sister Kathy's older, I'm younger. She always said, in any sandwich, just the filling matters. <laughs> so she would call Kathy and me for slices. The older the other, the filling is what matters. Middle children, think about it. The filling. But anyway, one of the things that this my favorite hymn is that ends up is something, and I think. This speaks to us of our life in Christ. It's realistic. It's not phony. And whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows.
works and rise to bless you still, to marvel at your beauty and glory in your ways, and make a joyful duty our sacrifice of praise.